make sure we lift Brother Quentin up in prayer today. And uh, we may be brief this morning. I want you to pray for the service at 11 o'clock, please. Pray for the service tonight at uh, 6 o'clock. We need the Lord's strength here today. Yeah. I want to just begin this morning as I prayed about what I would uh, share with you today. I just want to share with you a little bit of my week, and then we're going to read some scripture and talk about Jesus for a few minutes. Um, I had a couple of encounters this week with some folks that the Lord has really impressed upon my heart to pray for, and uh, I'd like to share it with the church this morning because I want to ask you to help me pray for these individuals. I've uh, been doing a little... Uh, Working on the side, you know, most of you know, uh, I do drywall work. We're just part-time in drywall now. We don't do it full-time anymore, but I do work part-time uh, to sort of uh, help make ends meet a little better. And we were working over in Bristol earlier in the week, and I got off early, as it were, that day. I finished up what I had to do. So, uh, you know, while I was there, I thought, you know, I've got a handful of uh, gospel tracts. I'll just walk down State Street while I'm here, and we'll hand out a few tracts while we're here. And uh, everything went well that day. I underestimated the cold. I don't remember if this was Monday or Tuesday. It was early in the week, but it was so cold that I was only able to stay out there for about 45 minutes. I was unprepared for the cold. I didn't have a coat. I had a like a hoodie on that was it was semi warm, but it was so cold that by the time 45 minutes was up, <laughs> I, I was having trouble moving my hands. It was that cold, so we uh, we sort of uh, packed it up and finished up there. Uh, but while I was out there for 45 minutes, I was able to give out a few gospel tracts, and uh, everyone that day on State Street that I extended my hand to, to take a track, every person received one. There was not one person who refused. Now, uh, if you do this regularly, you will find that some people are just rude. Some people uh, don't uh, have the kindness of God in their hearts. Some people will uh, just flat out reject it. They'll, they'll deny they want to try to take one. Everyone that day received a gospel track. And then the next day, Something similar happened, and uh, I finished up what I was doing early, and I was in Jonesboro, and uh, did the same thing. I went down to Main Street there in Jonesboro, handing out gospel tracts, and, uh, you know, everything was going well. I was handing them out. People were taking them, and then I got to this one lady, and uh, she extended her hand and received the gospel, and said, well, thank you very much. And then she looked at the cover of it and saw that uh, the front of it said, do you have true salvation? And then she turned instantly and became angry and, and literally threw the thing back at me. And uh, she had a young man with her, and he took a gospel track, and I don't know what their relation was. I don't know if it was mother and son or, or if they were just friends or what. Uh, but he received a track. He took it kindly. But, uh, you know, pray for that woman because she was the only person in two days or two outings, we might say, of me going out and handing out gospel tracts. She was the only one person that refused one. Uh, so pray that God would open her heart, uh, do a work in her life. I don't know what her story is. Maybe she's someone who, uh, she's angry with God. Maybe she's been hurt. Maybe she's of some other religion. Uh, but she needs God to open her eyes and open her heart to receive the gospel because the gospel is the only message that's going to help anybody today. Everything in this world is temporal. Uh, the things that we deal with in life, only the things of God are, are going to last. And sometimes, uh, just sharing my heart this morning, we fall into the uh, you know, the uh, assumption that just because we live in the Bible Belt, right here in northeast Tennessee, or uh, southwest Virginia, uh, that everybody just loves the Lord. But there are some people out there who don't know Him. And uh, they need to be saved. 
And it's a reminder, it's a good reminder for all of us to uh, take the ministry of the gospel seriously, uh, to obey the Lord, to do what He said to do, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature, uh, because there's many out there who need to hear that uh, today. So uh, we just wanted to share that with you this morning, help us to, to pray. I had another encounter yesterday. Uh, we went down to the Jehovah's Witnesses Conference in Johnson City uh, and spent about an hour out there yesterday at Freedom Hall. Thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses around. Um, most of them were inside the building at that time. I was outside the building. Uh, there were several that were walking in and out from the parking lot. So uh, dozens of Jehovah's Witnesses heard the gospel, heard the word of God yesterday. We thank God for that, but uh, I want to mention another gentleman this morning to sort of update the church on some things that have been going on this week because I want you to pray for this man. A gentleman approached me on the sidewalk. Uh, he wasn't one of the Jehovah's Witnesses. He was a man who lived in the area, and he just happened to be out walking his dog. And I had a brief discussion with him. And uh, he asked me where I went to church at. I told him. And uh, he immediately uh, became sort of agitated just at the mention of church and said that when he looked around the world today, he didn't see anything but just a, a form of godliness and some sort of organized religion. And uh, he was alleging that he didn't see any indication that there was a true church left on the earth. And uh, I, had a, I had a little talk with him and assured him that there was indeed a true church, uh, that uh, God had uh, a church on the earth, and I knew so with certainty because the Bible says so. And uh, I want you to pray for that individual because the Lord has burdened it upon my heart that maybe, uh, you know, I'm one who self-reflects. I was taught to self-reflect uh, everything that I do, everything that I say, I reflect upon that. I try to think what I could have done better, where I failed, where I came short. And I think I came up a little short in my conversation with him yesterday. Um, I, I was uh, uh, very informative to him to the point. I was quite frank with him that there was a true church left. And uh, it might not have been as gracious to him as I should have been. Uh, so... That's just a self-reflection on my part. I know that the Word was shared with him, and God's Word is not going to come back void. Uh, but I want you to pray for him, uh, that something from that encounter that he'll take away uh, to help him. And pray for me, that I'll always uh, have the, uh, the demeanor and the right attitude that God would have me to have when I'm engaging with other people who may, uh, you know, uh, be adverse to the Lord. They may be contrary to the Lord. How many of you know that when you're face to face with somebody who uh, is hateful toward God, that could be a very trying situation? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know anybody who handles it perfectly. I know I certainly don't, but I have a desire uh, to do better, and I have a desire to show people the love of the Lord. And just to my own self-reflection, uh, I think I probably could have done a little bit better in that case. I, I mean, I wasn't just downright hateful with the man. I don't want to give you that impression. I'm just saying I, maybe I could have been a little bit more gracious. So let's take that. I want you to learn from my life. Um, I'm not always perfect. Uh, I could do better at times. And let's always just be mindful to try to be as gracious as we can when we're uh, talking with unbelievers and those who may be contrary to the Christian faith. Amen? I believe we'd be well off to keep that in mind. Uh, but I want you to pray for these folks. I want to talk just a few minutes about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be in John, I'm going to start in John chapter 1. And then we're just going to, we're going to use our Bibles quite a bit for a few minutes because I'm going to be flipping a few other places in the Gospel of John. And I just want to share a little bit about Christ and His deity today. We've talked here before about the prologue of John, which is John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Uh, those verses are often referred to as the prologue of John. 
And everything that you'll read in the Gospel of John is filtered through that prologue. Those first 18 verses, it sets up the deity of Christ. It sets up who Christ is. So we have to keep in mind that when we read the Gospel of John, when we get past those first 18 verses, God doesn't change His mind about who Christ is. Everything that John says throughout the rest of this gospel is filtered through the prologue, those first 18 verses. And I'm not going to read all 18 verses, but I do want to read the first few verses in John chapter 1 this morning. And uh, this is very fitting uh, since we were trying to minister to Jehovah's Witnesses yesterday. I didn't set it up this way, but uh, if, if many of you have had any encounters with Jehovah's Witnesses, you'll, uh, off, you'll remember that uh, they have a, a distorted reading of the first verse of John that says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That's what their Bible says, the New World Translation. One of the worst translations available today uh, that denies the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have to be very careful if they uh, come knocking on your door or you end up in a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness because they are well trained. Most of them can argue First John, or excuse me, they can argue John one and one in a comatose state. I mean, they're just they're they're that automatic with it. Uh, but none of this changes the fact that the church, the true church, has for two thousand years believed without fail that Jesus Christ is God and that God is a Trinity. That there are uh, three persons who share the one nature of God. There is one God. There's not three gods. There's one God. And the, the Godhood, the, the essence and the nature of God is shared equally by three persons. That's the only way you could have Jesus praying to the Father in John chapter 17. He's not a ventriloquist throwing his voice up when he's praying to the Father. Uh, when when uh, he's baptized and the Spirit descends from heaven like a dove, you have all three persons of the Trinity present there at the same time. You've got the Father speaking from heaven, you've got the Son being baptized, and you've got the Holy Ghost descending from heaven like a dove. And I cannot, and I want to make this clear to each and every one of you, because some of you may not believe this, but I cannot hold this Bible in my hand and claim to be a Christian and deny the Trinity. I can't do it. I cannot do it. And that's just the truth of the situation. And everything that John says is filtered through these first verses in the prologue. And here's what it says. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John is very masterful in his writing here in these first four verses. He is uh, directly asserting the deity of Jesus Christ. He is telling us that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God. He's not a God. He is the God. He is God. He is God the Son. He shares in the essence of God with the Father and the Holy Ghost. The Father is God. The Son also shares equally in the Godhead and the Spirit of God shares equally in the Godhead and there's only one God. Don't get our categories mixed up. It's not one God equals three gods and it's not one person equals three persons. It's one God in three persons. Two different categories. You have the God category and the person category. And this is, this is what the Bible teaches. Amen? Alright. So John is very masterful. He's established that Jesus Christ is God right here in the first several verses. But that's not the only way that he establishes the deity of Jesus Christ. He also establishes the deity of Jesus Christ by using a phrase that the other gospel writers just do not emphasize. And that is the phrase, I am. John emphasizes this in his gospel. The phrase, I am. In the Greek, ego I am. 
Jesus said this several times. He said, I am. And this is another way that the gospel, that the, uh, the deity of Christ is emphasized in the Gospel of John. Go with me please to John chapter 8, verse number 24. Let's open our Bibles up. John chapter 8, verse 24. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. Get it open. Turn your Bible to John chapter 8. Amen. And look at verse number 24. And then we're going to look at several other scriptures quickly here today. In John 8, 24. The words of Jesus. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins for if ye believe not that I am. Now that word he is italicized. That means that the King James translators had to add that word to get the Greek to flow into the English. So when you see an italicized word in the King James Bible, that means that it was not in the original Greek, that the translators had to add that because sometimes when you're translating Greek into English, it doesn't flow very well unless you add these words to make up uh, you know, the structure of the sentence, if you will. But it's ego I am. This is the Greek equivalent to what God spoke in the Old Testament in the Hebrew language when God said, told uh, Moses, go down there and tell Pharaoh that I am sent you. Lord, who should I say sent me? Tell him that I am sent you. So what Jesus is saying here in the Greek is essentially the same thing that God told to Moses, go say that I am sent you. Jesus said, I am. I am He. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. He's not saying that I am the Father. He's saying that I am God, just as the Father is God and the Holy Spirit is God. We know that Jesus is not the Father, that they are two distinct individuals. All you have to do to determine that is open your Bible and read from John chapter 17. And you will see Jesus praying to God the Father and there in the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 17, Jesus says this. He says, Father, restore unto me the glory of I love this. He's not talking to himself. The Son is talking to the Father. He said, Father, restore unto me the glory that I had with you. He wasn't by himself, just one person. He said, restore unto me the glory that I had with you before the world was. So there in eternity past, you've got two persons. You've got the Father and the Son. Amen? Any clear reading of the text will come to this same term, determination. Jesus said, I am. Look with me in chapter 8, verse number 58. He says it again. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Ego I am. I am. He's deity. He's God. Go with me please to chapter 13 now of the Gospel of John. We love to hear those pages of the Bible ruffling out there. I love to look into the Bible. John chapter 13. See, this is where I'm coming up with this stuff. It's coming out of the Bible. Amen? I'm not just up here giving you my opinion. I'm telling you what the Bible says. John 13 verse number uh, 19. He says it again. Same words, ego I am. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am He. And now in John chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. They answered Him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am He. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with him. And as soon as he had said 
unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. <laughs> now why would they do that? At the proclamation of Jesus Christ as deity, as God. So we see here in the Word of God that John emphasizes the deity of Christ in these I am statements that the other gospel writers don't emphasize. Now it's mentioned one time in the gospel of Mark. Why is that? It's because the other gospel writers had a different purpose. They had other things that they were more focused upon than emphasizing uh, the deity of Christ in those specific places. But uh, there's no greater proof that Jesus Christ is God than to see God in His creation. And uh, one of the reasons, or one of the places that we could see God as Creator is in Colossians chapter 1. So go with me please to Colossians chapter 1. And as we stood there at the Jehovah's Witnesses conference yesterday, now, I went there just so everyone understands. Somebody say, somebody may say, Pastor, why in the world would you do something like that? Well, we go there to be a blessing to people. Amen? We don't go there to antagonize. I don't go there to try to win some sort of intellectual debate with somebody. I couldn't care less about winning a debate. We go to declare the gospel. Uh, and it's God's gospel. And uh, he'll give the increase as he sees fit. And uh, we just want to be a blessing to folks. We're not out there to fight or to blast people. And uh, it works out really well. We're thankful for it. But in Colossians, we read every chapter in the Bible that I could think of yesterday to the Jehovah's Witnesses that pertained to the deity of Christ. Uh, not to be hateful to them, but because we love them. And they need to know this. Chapter 1 of Colossians, verses 15 through 17. We're going to read this, and then we're just going to wrap it up for Sunday school this morning. Here's what the Bible says. Well, let me go ahead and back up and catch verse 12, and we'll read 12 and forward. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. This goes right hand in hand with John chapter 1. You remember John chapter 1? All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 16 here says, For by Him were all things created. If all things were created by Christ, then Christ cannot be a created being. He is uncreated. He is eternal. You see, Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults believe that Christ was a created being. Well, the Bible says otherwise. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Now, some groups, religious groups, will look at verse number 15 where it says, firstborn, that Christ is the firstborn of every creature. And they'll try to look at that and say, see there, he was created. He's the firstborn. That's created. That's not what it means. The Bible also says in the Old Testament in a couple of places that Israel was the firstborn nation of God. But they weren't the first nation that came along. There were other nations before them. So let us all be reminded this morning of who God is. 
Let us all be reminded of who Christ is. Let us all be reminded of the person of Christ, the essence uh, of God that He possesses. He is God. He's eternal. Virgin born, sinless. Went to the cross. There died as a sacrifice for our sins. For whosoever shall call upon Him, they can be saved. They can be made a new creature. But He didn't stay dead. He, he arose on the third day. Victorious over death, hell, and the grave. That's what I'm talking about this morning. Jesus. This same Jesus. And He's coming again. And it could be today. Are you ready? Do you know it? Do you know the God of the Bible? My prayer is for you, my dear friend, that you do. That you do know Him. If you're here today and you know the Lord. And you're saved by the grace of God. I'm so glad to call you my brother or my sister in the Lord. But if you're here today, my dear friend, and you're lost, then my prayer and my desire for you is to repent and believe the gospel, to turn to Christ alone for your salvation, to look to Him and live. That's the plea. Look. Look and live. Look and live. Because if you'll call upon His name, He will make you a new creature. He will save those who call upon His name. Aren't you glad today? Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. We appreciate the Lord helping us today. It's not easy to fill in for Brother Quentin on Sunday, Sunday mornings for Sunday school. But I hope that we were able to say or do something or some of the scripture that we read this morning was a blessing to you. We want to be an encouragement to you. And we want to be a help to you. I hope you were blessed and encouraged today. Pray for the service at 11 o'clock. Amen. God bless you all.